Welcome to all uh, to our latest Listening to the Wind, the uh, weekly IWSA interview series, um, kind of focusing on wind propulsion, wind energy, and how to harness that at sea directly. Today, I'm sitting with Frank Newhouse, the CEO of uh, EconoWind, which is a developer of the Ventifor system. Frank is an innovator and serial entrepreneur with decades of experience in technology development. And he brings all of that to the wind propulsion sector in shipping. So Frank, I'd like to welcome you to uh, listening to the wind today. Thank you. And without too, too, too much delay, what I'd like to do is hand over to you to share your screen for your presentation. And I will see you in about 10 minutes on the other side. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gavin, for this nice introduction. Um, today, I would like to speak a little bit about um, uh, EconoWind. Um, um, and, and as um, um, Gavin is saying, we, we offer uh, systems for wind propulsion. And the, the big question is, what if we change and go back to sailing again? And when I say go back to sailing, I don't really mean fully. Um, but by using sales, uh, sailing systems reduce this uh, pollution, um, uh, as you still can see here on the back. Actually, this is the freezing sea, taking a picture this morning, the very first picture uh, on the North Sea. And you see the smog in the, um, in the background, uh, and hopefully we can um, uh, be part of the reduction of that in the future. So just a quick introduction on, um, uh, on some history. Um, our mother company, Konoship, uh, international and engineering firm in Groningen in the Netherlands, um, already in, the, in 2011, studied wind propulsion in cooperation with Technical University of Delft and uh, Marin and, and different other uh, suppliers like Eltec. Um, they studied different types of systems that were available at that moment. Um, uh, sky sails, flatner rotors, um, uh, and also the turbo sail uh, done by Jacques Cousteau in the 80s. Um, a quick analysis was made on the different um, uh, technologies, um, uh, how well could, could they work um, if you look at merchant ships, because obviously that gives a lot of um, uh, practical issues as well. And their conclusion was that the most promising uh, um, a solution was the system done by Jacques Cousteau um, uh, in the 80s, which really is a big airplane kind of wing with some special um, uh, aerodynamic tricks which can steer the force that the system is um, uh, generating. Um, the, the past years, we have designed different versions um, and they are uh, available um, um, uh, in, in that they all have their own uh, practical uh, way and their own power. One of the, the um, uh, systems is a containerized version. It's actually the first one we started with in order to do a quick uh, testing possibilities. Um, uh, it was easy to test it uh, and it, it runs up to 250 kilowatt per unit uh, at maximum uh, wind. And here on the bottom you see uh, the polar graph that goes with it. So at 90 degrees, uh, that is the point where, which we hit at wind power seven. Uh, and obviously that's right, right away touches some of the points of the wind. Sometimes it's not there. And then obviously the result is less. Um, the second version is a flat rack, uh, which was just installed on the Boomsma shipping. Um, uh, it's a little bigger unit. Uh, so the polar plot is a little bigger. And the third version it's like it's uh, done on the Anki uh, by now for um, uh, almost a year sailing around, uh, which is a retrofit. So it's connected all the time. I see my machine is doing automatic, so I will sometimes flip back for you for a sec. Uh, so a little bit on the theory of, um, uh, of wind propulsion. Um, here you see the lift coefficient and the angle of attack. Uh, this is graphs done by um, Jacques Cousteau in the 80s, and um, this is what we started on. And what you can see um, in this graph quickly is the amount of suction really determines how well the system is operating. Um, there's different 
different ways of um, um, uh, of looking at the, uh, the polar plots. One of the way is on the left side here, which is when you look at the apparent wind, and on the right side, when you look at the true wind. So this is actually two ways of showing the same graphs, but obviously in the apparent wind, your own uh, wind, your own uh, speed of the vessel is, um, uh, uh, is calculated. So the wind force is higher than when you look at it for the, in the true wind version. So anyway, in the general outlines, uh, what we try to do is reduce the fuel consumption of ships. And um, uh, since uh, some time now, uh, this is parametrized um, uh, by the EEXI, um, which is the energy efficiency on existing ships. Um, looking at the Anki, um, uh, what we have, what we had done is to make a prediction um, uh, already how it would be. And the prediction in the beginning, based on the research work of Conoship, was that we could do at the, 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 uh, uh, at the best winds um, up to some 25% of force reduction, which is quite a lot. But the question obviously is what happens when you truly sail? Because this is only when the, the wind is optimal, uh, but what is, what is left after some time? And that is obviously seen in the EEXI. That's a, a reality. So when we go sailing, oh, first, sorry, um, a quick, nice video on what it looks like on the Anki, uh, where you see right away, one of the things that we do is at headwinds uh, or at bad winds, we can um, uh, take the system down to fold them. So here you see the, um, the, what really happened when we were testing for reality. Uh, on the bottom here, you see when the foil was going up and here it was going down and here it was going up again. Uh, in red here, you see the speed through the water, uh, which was going up. When the foil was going up, the, system, the, the ship was speeding up from 8.9 to 10.1 knots. Um, uh, when we took the foil down again, the, the speed reduced again. And after uh, we put it up again, the speed went up again. Um, obviously, the wind is plotted here, so that plays a little bit of a part. But the nice thing that you could see is when it speeds up by putting the foils up, at the same time, the fuel, re the fuel um, uh, consumption is reduced. And actually, the fuel consumption is reduced by some 12% where the speed will, um, through the water is going up. And this is really what always happens. Um, faster sailing and at the same time, lower fuel, fuel uh, consumption. And this obviously is on because the, the wind unit is pulling the ship through the water, so it increases, but the propeller then has less resistance, so it starts to use less fuel. And in the end, that comes down and is um, uh, seen in the EEXI, which, which obviously is a formula um, uh, which says something on the fuel consumption uh, per dead weight ton per mile. Um, it was entered into and, and it will enter into force in 2023 and um, uh, it will be applicable for all ships over 400 uh, uh, tons. Well, what we, we do, did on the Anki is we have an external party that is doing the motor management system and they, they measure the um, uh, fuel oil consumption uh, every five minutes. Um, uh, and in the red dots, you see the, the situations uh, of the fuel consumption, uh, depending, of course, on the, on the actual state of the sea and the speed it's going. But this is the, the red dots is typical um, uh, of the ship. And we measured this prior to setting up the foils. Uh, so you have more red dots than green dots. And the red dots is when the venti foils are up. Uh, and the green dots is when the venti foils are down. When accumulating all the um, uh, green dots, we could see that the EEXI is actually lowered by 5%. And this was done over the first few months when we just did the first um, uh, automation and um, still things are, are um, uh, ready for some improvements. Um, so um, this is done by an external party showing the EEXI is uh, uh, by minus 5% now, and over the long run, we expect that this will be 8%. Uh, 
especially because in the near future we, we will enlarge these wings by adding another extension. Well, quickly looking at a customer case and some market opportunity, what are we really talking about? Uh, basically, what we think uh, if we calculate um, uh, um, uh, through uh, one ventifold on a ship, because a ship really uses quite a lot of fuel, um, uh, it will reduce as much as 3 million car kilometers per year um, if the ship is operating um, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, the savings are about 1.1 ton of, ton of fuel uh, per sailing day on an average. Um, and then um, uh, well, we end up in these kind of um, uh, numbers. Uh, obviously, uh, we are looking at the future potential. And one of the things that we're thriving for is to upscale EconoWind as a company um, uh, and also upscale the size of the units um, and in the end, we hope to um, uh, manage a 20% uh, reduction in CO2 emissions. Um, and if you look then at the market potential, and obviously we will not be um, uh, uh, the only player, so there will be many, many players. But on the other hand, this, the potential for saving uh, is quite large because of the total available market uh, being extremely large with over 30,000 ships. Um, with a, a typical serviceable available market of some 6,000 ships. Well, we hope to do part of that. And in the end, if you look at the total market uh, potential, like um, uh, CE Delft was estimating that um, a wind propulsion will play a major role in reduction of CO2 uh, with a total market of some one and a half to two and a half billion euro uh, turnover by 2030. So to wrap it up, um, uh, EconoWind is um, uh, born, so to say, uh, to offer Econology. Um, obviously, we, we want to have an, an, uh, um, a cleaner way, but make it also economical, feasible. Um, and um, uh, this, this ends up in, a, in an overview. Uh, the Ventifoils are available today. There's already a few ships sailing today with our solutions. Um, we managed to have a reduction of the EEXI, which is measured by a third party. Um, uh, realistic savings can be up to 20% in this Anki um, a situation when it's wind power seven from the right uh, angle. Obviously, when there's less wind, uh, there will be less savings. Um, but the nice thing is the ship can remain the same. There's no significant modification necessary to the ship. Um, and also for the, uh, for the captain, the captain decides when he wants to sail, yes or no, and the rest will is done uh, automatically. Um, in the end, um, on an economical scale, uh, the coming years we manage and we will strive to get a pay-as-you-sail uh, financial structure. Anyway, I hope to give an in this was an interesting introduction. And um, uh, back to you, Gavin. Uh, and, and if there's any questions uh, that are... Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I think you've touched on, you know, some some of the really in this last slide, some of those really key aspects around what makes wind propulsion uh, a really important solution for the industry. I mean, just, just that top one that it's available today. I mean, that that's absolutely key. Yeah, that we're not waiting a decade to roll roll out the system. Um, but also, I think, yeah, yeah, no, yeah please, that's Frank, go ahead. Yeah, that's really what we strived for um, uh, the past few years. After Conoship studied it in principle from 2016, we really tried to be available um, uh, and just uh, time to market has been very important for us. Yeah, and actually on, on that point of time to market, I mean, there is a long lead time for, for innovators. I mean, it, yeah, that we, we, we hear the valley of death being, being talked about in innovation where, you know, you're you're bleeding money on one side, but you're yet to sell many units on the other. Um, yeah. how, how do we bridge that? You know, what is in it? How do we bridge that? And what's in it for innovators and entrepreneurs like yourself? Hmm. That's a very good and difficult question. Um, uh, I must say I was in a, a somewhat lucky position that I could do this work uh, for a few years um, uh, on selling my previous company. 
Um, so, and, and I really just ran into uh, Gus van der Bles who studied this and I thought, yeah, the transition, uh, the energy transition is important uh, and will be given um, uh, important chances. Um, but indeed, I didn't realize when we started that this was everything was was very big and 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 cumbersome and and it takes a long time. Uh, so your question on how do you do that? You know, well, it's obviously that uh, in the end, the, this 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 time needs to be financed, and that is what I've learned a long time ago. Uh, when you think I can make a prototype, uh, that's not enough. Um, there's lots of inventors inventing things and and you should be able to make 10 units on your own investment and if you can't do that that is very difficult and then obviously that is on this kind of systems very difficult so we looked on day one uh, we started to look at at people to finance us and so i we found um, uh, a few um, uh, uh, people that were uh, also very keen on on playing a role and also uh, the banks are um, uh, quite involved. Uh, also this EEXI uh, is also by the Poseidon principles. Mm. Uh, now with, with banks, it's important where the bank is, is really looking at, at um, uh, ship owners to reduce their EEXI. Uh, so, so that is really, in the end, the money needs to come. It needs to be financed somehow, this startup uh, time. That was your question. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I, I, what I'm seeing in the market, um, and what I got from your presentation as well, is that the you know, the, the the layers or the, the the various aspects that need to be in place are starting to come together. So we've got policy, we've got the regulation coming in, we've got banks taking another look at their portfolios, um, you know, with item principles, for example, and we've got demonstrated vessels and demonstrated technologies now. Yeah, exactly, and, and, yeah. and I must say, Gavin, that is the most important. I mean, there was this research program, WASP, mm. uh, uh, and 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 you you probably are aware of the of the first people that said, okay, we will we will do that, and and this is where people like Boomsma Shipping and Jan van Dam, uh, uh, and and a little later also Tarsis. These are the, the somewhat smaller companies that that have you know they're partly family owned. And they really feel we have to do something. Hmm. We have to play a part and it's our personal choice uh, to do it. And that is also a little bit on your question on, on how do you bridge that gap? It's, it's, yeah, it, it's innovators all along. Also ship some innovative, innovative shop, ship owners, they just want to do it. Hmm. And um, are, are, is it already proven economically? Theoretically, yes, it was. Uh, we had a good story, but of course they stuck out their neck uh, mm. and they decided let's we we want to do it. And I think that's what you need as an uh, innovator that you meet these kind of people, and and it's great when when once you found them and they really helped us a lot. Yeah, and I think I think it's that it's it's actually um, sort of predicated on us to make sure that those first movers you know reap some of the benefits and, and are protected from that and and get some subsidies. Uh, to yeah. help bridge that gap, and I think that's yeah, really, must, really, really important. Exactly, and I must mm. say, then, then the governments are are also playing their part. Uh, mm. that, that the, the the subsidy is part of the uh, of 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 this time, and once all the uh, possible future taxes come in place, then the market will start to run. Uh, but then also, it will be a different ball game for us. As a uh, then, it's not innovation anymore. Then you need to be really a pumping factory. Mm. Uh, prices will go down. They need to go down, uh, uh, and then the whole game is different again. And, yeah, no, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And I think you know, when 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 I'm I'm discussing you know the the uptake of wind propulsion, quite often when somebody's focusing on ROIs, return on investments on the first unit or the first two units, you know, in in a situation where we've got quite heavily subsidised directly and indirectly subsidised fossil fuel. Those ROIs don't really make any sense. As we spread out to the tenth unit or the hundredth unit, as you see, the, the cost is going to be down. Plus, you've got the economy of scale. I, I, yeah, it's it's it, it's you've got to you've got to look a couple of years down the, the pipeline as well. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree. And and uh, uh, as in every um, technology, this will happen. Uh, 
um, but you did in, in the beginning, you do need to have the people that want to do it at that uh, first level. Uh, and at that first time, also, you see that governments are, are willing to support it um, uh, by some subsidies and some research, because obviously everybody wants to know that it really works. So um, uh, thanks to this Interreg program of WASP, mm. uh, managed to, to subsidize the first few systems. So that was a, a little better to do for these first guys, but still they really stuck out their neck to do it. And, and I mean, you're proving, proving that yeah. So um, I'm just wondering, you know, on, on one of the slides, you talked about the market, um, you know, what, um, how many vessels are, uh, are potential for this technology. I just wanted to, to, to see, do you, which segments of the shipping market do you see as being, you know, your prime markets for this technology? And also, um, you know, that would be size of vessel as well. But also, where do you see the real drive geographically? Is it going to be in Europe? Is it going to be in America, uh, the Far East? But where are you looking at being the, the sort of big growth areas of, of the market? Well, that's interesting. Obviously, the past four years, uh, the United States didn't really uh, do much. Uh, and probably you see there's going to be some, uh, some, some, um, uh, some extra push there now. Um, uh, Europe has been um, uh, extremely pushy. Uh, I think that, um, especially in the northern countries, they already have harbors that 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 are, are pushing this EEXI already very much, and they really look at it already, where it's not totally mandatory uh, worldwide yet. Um, uh, in Asia, I also see a lot of um, uh, questions being asked, but for us as a company, obviously, when you start. You start from your home country. That is, um, uh, if it's possible, that is easier. Um, so, so we really think it is going to start from from Europe. Um, uh, the first three systems in this was program uh, are are, are um, uh, Dutch companies. We found uh, there. Um, uh, and on the other hand, there is, I think, a Danish or a, a German company involved mm -hmm. in the project. That's right. Yeah. And, and I thought it was a Swedish or Norwegian company. What was the fifth one? I'm not sure. Yeah, the, you've got Scanned Lines. Um, Scanned lines yeah. And you've also got um, uh, Gord Braden. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so so I, I think it is going to start from here, but that is just because we, we obviously are local here. So you you it, it, the, the best chance is it starts from your local market. Mm. But I, I do see uptake from from all around the world now. We, it, it is slowly getting, we are getting some questions. Um, and I think everybody in the world is 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 keen on, and, and everybody really starts to understand this climate change is, is really pushing us hard to, yep. to, uh, to do something. And do you, do you see it as, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the Ventfold system or the systems that you're developing in particular, are those mainly being used on smaller vessels or larger vessels? Bulk carriers, tankers, container ships. Which markets are you specifically looking at at the moment? Yeah, it, it's exactly the ones that you're saying. The bulk carriers and the tankers. There are obviously numbers uh, that's mm -hmm. sort of the serviceable market. Um, uh, they, they are using quite a lot, but they're not so big. I mean, if if we would try to propel um, uh, one of those 300 meters. Um, uh, 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 container vessels, they are so big that it is hardly noticeable. Uh, you should put such huge systems on them before it gets noticeable. Mm. So that, that is more difficult. So typically the ships like the Anki being uh, some 3,800 3, tons, mm -hmm. uh, the Frisian Sea of Bomsma is 6,800 tons. Uh, uh, that was the starting market. Um, we, we are seeing now, obviously the bigger the ship, um, uh, the more impact, and you can put uh, somewhat bigger units, but in total amount of saving, uh, obviously they have a bigger problem, and and you can do you can do a little more. So, I would say about twenty thousand tons would would be great. Um, right. And looking and discussing with a few uh, even bigger uh, ships, and then they right they right away would like to put four or six units on. Right. So, um, uh, Makes but, but sense. Yeah. Generally, the bunkers and the tanker market are um, uh, uh, are the ones to start. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and and there's plenty of ships that need this 
need the need the retrofits and need the uh, the technologies. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering uh, your take on you know, where wind propulsion fits into this kind of wider decarbonisation uh, okay. debate. Yeah. We've got a lot of noise coming from alternative fuels, um, yeah. uh, but you know, from what I can see, maybe maybe we're, we're talking about a lag in time there before those are deployable. So, so where does wind fit into this picture? Uh, that, that, that is quite obvious, um, uh, Gavin. Uh, uh, today, if somebody compares us to the current today business with the typical uh, bunker fuel being uh, some 400, 420 euro, euros per ton or dollar per ton, uh, then it's difficult. But if you look at the, at the near future, people will start to go with alternative fuels that are about five to ten times more expensive. Um, and why are they expensive? Because they are not widely available yet. Mm. Um, uh, and, and in the end, we expect that they will remain um, uh, expensive because uh, if you really do them sustainable, they have to come from windmills. And then you have wind on, this, on, the, uh, on the sea, which is put into a windmill, which is put into electricity, which is then be made into hydrogen or ammonia, or what have you. And these are all ways um, uh, which, which energy is lost. So wind energy, um, uh, about some 80 to 90 percent of the of the energy that was in the wind in the first place uh, uh, is lost um, uh, and and mm -hmm. then if you put wind propulsion on the ship right away uh, even you could say that a 10 meter system or a 20 meter system in 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 energy source coming from the wind you could multiply that easily by six so right, right away it is it's a much more efficient way so i expect that it will always go together uh, and, and like in cars, in the beginning, it was hybrid systems, and still that is a, a good way. And I, I expect in shipping to be that, that hybrid systems where wind propulsion is on the ship directly, um, uh, but also if there is no wind, obviously you still need other fuels. Absolutely, yeah. And, and you know I agree with you there, the, the, the hybrid approach, absolutely. The hybrid Absolutely. approach is everything. And, no, you know, indeed. If, you, if you would, if if we would strive now to go to ships that are hundred uh, percent in the wind, uh, uh, in wind propulsion, you get right away get get back to the old problems. That what do you do when there's no wind? <laughs> so we yep. rather do hundred ships uh, of ten percent reduction instead of ten ships of hundred percent reduction. Although that also, of course, uh, there is going to be a market uh, also sh on the short term. Where people want to go 100% um, uh, with, with total zero emission, but our view is mostly to reduce fuel um, on ships that are already out in the sea by by some 10 to 20 percent. That would be our goal. Yeah, and I, I and I think I think both both of those threads of development are are incredibly important. I mean, we need to decarbonize the existing fleet and all where we wind assist. And, and equally valid to, to to develop those primary wind vessels and and who knows you know the hundred hundred percent wind vessel that converts some of that energy back into fuel yeah absolutely they're, they're, we, we we've got some we've got some interviews coming with companies that are looking at that that's yeah. that's some way off as well so yeah that's, that's I, i'm just gonna i'm gonna ask you yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna sort of touch on one one last thing in in this kind of discussion section um you know, if if you were talking about safe pay as you sail, and and I think that that is a really important uh, financial hurdle to, to get over, where you're, you're converting heavy cap the heavy capital expenditure into more kind of an operational expense. Um, if you could change one part of the kind of innovation ecosystem or the or the financing ecosystem. Would it be that, or would it be some other um, uh, development that you would change? <laughs> well, unfortunately, um, in these innovations, you have to do a lot of things, so it's hard to say one. But this is one that I didn't see coming uh, some four years ago. Um, and the funny thing is that I found that there's there's people that like to do this kind of innovation technically, like like we do. But there was there were we we also found people that have money. Uh, uh, and they really want to put their money into uh, something worthwhile. Uh, and so that was why we were able to, to 
to develop something like pay as you sell, where where people that want to put their money into um, uh, into the reduction and, and into climate change um, uh, fighting, uh, they 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 made this possible. Uh, so mm -hmm. there are people that wanted to invest. Uh, so the first customers didn't have to put up the capex themselves, but they could um, uh, uh, borrow the money in a, in a very uh, innovative way. Uh, which, which indeed means that that their OPEX is is um, uh, set to the same level, uh, uh, and therefore it was possible for them to do. So, yeah, and I think we've seen this in other important. sectors. Yeah, with, yeah. With, with cars, I think I think the automobile in pretty much took off once you had financing available. The solar panel industry that is yeah. a famous. So why not? Why not? Why not in shipping? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's it's really. I think that is one of the things I didn't expect, but now is a is a major driver. Um, mm. uh, it it has to be made possible, and and um, uh, the whole shipping industry is is very. Um, uh, the financing is very difficult. They are, the ships are quite expensive. Financing schemes are very important. Uh, so within that role, um, uh, for these extra systems that save that save money. Uh, uh, pay as you sell uh, construction uh, uh, is, is quite important. That's really interesting. Okay, so we're going to now we're now going to take a break from from the, the discussion section, and I'm going to hit you with some quick fire questions. So, so these are a series of questions. I'd like a, a, a one sentence answer, really tight. Um, you can do a yes or no, but it would be nice to have a little bit more information as well. Okay, so if you're ready. Yeah. The stop clocks on. Okay, the stop watches on. Um, you gave us a little bit of a story about how you got into this, but why shipping? Why did you personally get involved with shipping? Um, because I met Gus van der Bles, and he was um, uh, extremely enthusiastic about the, the opportunities. And uh, he had a great idea, and he looked for somebody that was um, uh, able to, uh, to do the, the hardware. Uh, and we just met, and as persons, we clicked. So that was the the real reason. But I was looking for something because I thought the coming twenty years are going to be about uh, energy transition. So I was looking for that market segment. Yeah, no, I think you've I think you've chosen chosen one that's very impactful, but maybe not easy, but has a tremendous impact. So, so that's great. Um, do you think retrofits or new builds are going to be the most active areas for all women? Um, in the end, new builds and on the first five to ten years, uh, the retrofits. Uh, but in the end, obviously, if you do a new build, you can have a different uh, because you always need a main engine, mm -hmm. uh, some sort, uh, uh, unless you go totally, of course, unless you go totally 100% um, um, uh, on sailing. But for the normal logistics, you need some kind of engine. Um, uh, so, um, um, then I think that the retrofits are, are very important on the first few years and slowly the new builds will come up and then you can, you can optimize the, the engine uptake and the, and, the, and the fuels that are being used. No, absolutely. Okay. Um, what are your next steps? I mean, are you, do you have plans for expansion, uh, you know, collaborations that are coming through? Anything you can share with us on? Yeah. Well, really, anything that gets this going. I, I, I really was um, by now I'm pulled on to um, uh, to get this going somewhere, and and um, uh, and I see how large this um, this market is. So as to, as a small company, it's impossible to do it. But the first steps will be to enlarge the systems by itself, mm -hmm. um, and then manage to enlarge the amount of systems. Um, uh, so so just get more more systems out there. And that is only possible if we we work out the uh, all the little problems that we still have on on these first systems, uh, little issues on on different sides. Uh, but in the end, once it's really an uptake, it's much quicker to to do that together with somebody who's well uh, right. in the market and already has quite a considerable size. So bringing to scale, you're going to need partners. You're going to need collaborations. Um, cooperation is is better than trying to do everything yourself. I, I like that. I like that idea. Okay. Um, this is a difficult question that I always ask uh, every interviewee. Um, have you done the carbon footprint? Have you calculated carbon footprint? 
You mean of our own system? Yes. Yeah. Um, the honest answer is no. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think the 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 general idea that saving saving CO two by uh, by wind um, as a fuel is is quite good for your own uh, uh, carbon footprint. More privately, I did so when I started to go into this in the industry. Uh, I was in the medical field before. Mm. First thing I did was um, uh, put solars on my roof, uh, buy an electric car, and, and everything I could. Um, uh, but the, the real calculation on the on the CO two footprint, because I, I think that's what you mean, uh, make yeah. aluminum and everything. No, no, no. It, it, that is too difficult uh, for me to 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 do in the beginning. But it's a good point. I think mm. we should do that one day. No, absolutely, and I, and I think yeah, there's increasing interest to see to see those full uh, a carbon and, and environmental footprints as well, not just not just carbon. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Are you hiring at the moment? Are we hiring? Yes. Um, uh, yes, we are. We are hiring um, uh, at the at the moment that the next project will come. We will definitely hire. Uh, we already have two persons that are we are in discussion with. We are expecting. Um, uh, a fourth uh, a project to start, um, uh, but it still needs to be uh, uh, finalized. Um, and, and there's a lot of um, uh, interest. Um, so, uh, are we hiring today? Uh, we are looking for people. We are discussing with people for the, at the moment that it comes. Uh, but I think we will hire quite a lot of people uh, over the coming two, three years. Okay, great, great. So, opportunities there. Okay, uh, two more questions. Um, what is the most difficult question you've been asked? This sounds like an interview for a job. <laughs> what is the most difficult question that you've been asked concerning your systems and how did you answer it? Whoa. <laughs> Uh, a actually, little bombshell for you. It's the most difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most difficult question. Okay. <laughs> no, but um, uh, um, yeah, it, it's it, the, the most difficult question for, for me is when really big companies um, mm. they they really want to save money with the first system that we that we produce against the old old polluting um, uh, diesel that they're using today. Right. Uh, I think that's the most difficult question generally. Um, so, how much can we? How much can we reduce our our emissions? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Now, what? What the, the question is? How much money can we save? Ah, okay, right. That is all thinking, and 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 um, then it depends. Uh, uh, if you're polluting today and it doesn't cost anything, then it's of course very difficult to do. So. In the end, the economics are, are quite difficult, uh, but luckily, as I said before, we have the space you save. The governments are uh, pushing this a little bit. Mm. And I'm quite sure that once the economy of scale kicks in, uh, it will be possible. Okay, okay, that's great. Um, and okay, my last question. Um, if you could change one thing in the last two to three years that you've done about bringing your systems to market, what would that be? Hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, Maybe no change. You, you... No, I think I think we. You know what what happens is you 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 meet people um, uh, and they ask you things. Uh, I could have studied more, but I think this time to market was was holy for us. Uh, we hmm. wanted to sail within two years. Um, uh, what I would have done probably difficult different. Is we have done a few tests and then we forgot to put on the wind, um, which is a little bit of a joke. But we we have had a few times where we where we had the container on ships uh, uh, in the testing period where we've been extremely unlucky that we were a week without any wind. Right, uh, right. That that has been difficult um, uh, because you you plan a test for one week, uh, and and wind propulsion really depends a little bit on statistics. So if you if you get and you do your tests in one week when there's no wind at all, then that is a little difficult. Um, yeah, and those I mean those percentages that that we always see you know or we're always talking about the five percent eight percent. I mean those pretty much are on motor vessel operational yeah. profile. 
well. Yeah. So you're not making any adjustment for the wind. But if the wind's not blowing on that week, then you're not getting any data at all. If you average yeah. it out over a year, that's fine. But if you're yeah. doing a test, yeah. It's yeah, and on the other hand, your question is: uh, This is obviously what we, what many people do. They, 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 um, uh, in these kind of innovations, you can uh, test and test and test in in the laboratory uh, a long time. And we decided to test as quickly as possible as we could uh, on the actual systems on the sea. Hmm. Um, so I have seen some rust coming by of our very, very first function model. We call it in this first uh, container. Um, uh, but really, in the end, I'm very proud we did so. Um, uh, we, we, um, so, no, I, I think the approach we took is, is what I learned ahead of time. Uh, to do time to market is very important. Yeah. Um, uh, no, so generally, um, well, there are some things that I don't want to share because that's more private. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. I think, I think time to market absolutely is, is, is an important one. And I think you've done... You've done a great job in getting getting the systems um, up and running, tested, yeah. and now now pretty much ready ready to roll out as as a as a, a full market ready technology. So that's fantastic. Yeah. On that point, I'm now going to I'm now going to back off for a second. I'm going to give you a minute uh, of your own time to just do a little wrap up, um, uh, give, give the audience a bit of a takeaway. Um, so take it away, Frank. Well, actually, it is it is summarizing again what has been on this sheet for for a while. I think um, uh, there is shippers out there um, uh, that that are feeling the need for reduction of um, of their um, uh, pollutions, and uh, um, uh, and it is possible to go into the the new age, where where uh, it is possible to take the power of the wind, uh, and to 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 feel good um, uh, on on the total shipping. Uh, I think Jan van Dam said that perfectly. He says, I just want to sail. I've been behind my wheel for 40 years. Um, and, and I always thought, I'm fighting the wind. Um, why don't I use it? And, um, and I think that's very good. And it's, it's all uh, packed together in these few things. Um, by now, technology is there. So um, uh, I ho really hope there's more people like Jan van Dam and Boomsma Shipping and um, uh, Tarsus um, uh, that want to step into the future uh, and, and uh, help us all to reduce uh, the carbon emission. No, I think I, I, I would like to echo that. I think, you know, what, what uh, Jan Van Dan said uh, is, is probably the, uh, the moniker for the entire wind propulsion industry. Stop fighting the wind, use it. And, it, and it's uniquely available for the industry. Uh, there is no other transport sector that can utilize primary wind, uh, primary renewable of wind that's exclusively available for, for their yeah. vessel. Yeah, the same goes for Bomsma. And, and uh, once we, we, we install at, um, at Tarsus, I think they will see the same. Mm. It feels great uh, uh, to, to, to make it happen. The feel good factor. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Frank. Thank you very much for joining us today. And thanks I'd like to say, oh, so, <laughs> no, you're welcome. Um, and I'd like to say thank you to all of the viewers um, of joining us for listening to the wind. And um, I'd like to say, you know, fair winds to all. Please stay safe. Please stay well. And we will come back to you next week with another installment of Listening to the Wind. Um, Frank will be more than happy to answer any questions if you'd like to send uh, an email to him. And of course, if you'd like any more information on the wider wind propulsion world and other technologies that are available, I'm more than happy to answer those questions too. So, fair winds to you all. Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you, Gavin, for all your good work. <laughs>